just a, a couple of things to begin with. Uh, one for me, this is, of course, incredibly personal. I've been thinking about this for 30 years. Uh, one of the reasons I became a Christian was, as Bill Edgar said yesterday, was because of the problem of evil. I studied, uh, there was a BBC documentary called The World at War, and in that I remember as a teenager seeing a group of French Jews being pushed into a barn, and the barn being set on fire, and the Nazis saying, you can stay in there and burn, you can come out and be shot, take your pick. And I just remember thinking, why? And then I'm not old enough to have been a teenager in the 1960s, but I got a poster from there which was of the Vietnamese soldier being shot in the back. And it's a kind of iconic poster, and just the word, why? So it really bugged me. So I went to university to try and study the why thing. And I came to the conclusion that, um, that demonizing the Germans as though they were somehow a different race from other human beings was wrong, and that the problem was humanity, and that the problem was me, and the problem of evil made me um, look for the solution. So that's why I call this the apologetic of evil, because evil is usually used as a reason not to believe. I have a friend, uh, I ministered in a village called Brora in the Scottish Highlands, there was a woman from there who worked as a missionary to the Jews. She was in a Jewish cafe in Sydney and a group of young Jewish women uh, at the table next to her were, were talking and they said, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God. Because of Auschwitz, I don't believe in God. And she didn't know what to say until this older Jewish woman leaned over and said, I believe in God. And she rolled up her arm and there was the Auschwitz tattoo. Now. I find it really interesting and, and that um, the people who don't believe in God because of the problem of evil, some, not all, but some are what I would call middle class Western liberals who have a view of God, which is he's the big sugar daddy in the sky who if you are really good, he'll help you pass your exams and your granny won't die and your rabbit will never ever die. And sometimes we in the Christian church have presented that view of God almost, which is awful. I remember um, watching a woman, and I can't remember her name. I just know her as the woman with hair. That's all I can describe her, because I just remember her hair. She was an American televangelist. And I watched this show, and first of all, I thought it was comedy and satire. And then I realized it was real. And she was doing a, a, an outreach in Moscow in a, a stadium with about 20,000 people. And there were bits of it that culturally, for me, didn't really work. You know, like the, the, the power boys for Jesus, you know, smashing up bricks and, and all that kind of stuff. I thought, well, fair enough, you know, let them do that. <coughs> and then they did praise and so on. And then she spoke. And I've never, ever forgotten what she said. And it wasn't because it was memorably biblical. It was because it was so bad. She said, I want to tell you that God loves you. And how do you know that God loves you? I thought, well, that's a good start. And she said, I'll tell you how I know God loves me. Because when I was a little itty bitty girl, my chicken was crossing the road. And I thought, you're not going to tell a chicken crossing the road story. <laughs> and she did. My chicken was crossing the road. And my chicken got hit by a truck. And, she, <laughs> and my chicken went, Wah! and my chicken was dead. And I was a little girl and I prayed, Jesus, if you love me, heal my chicken. And my chicken went, Wah! and became alive. And that was bad enough. And then she said, if you'd like to come to Jesus, come to the front. And I thought, that's the gospel? That Jesus raises chicken? You're, 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 in a, you're in a country where 30 million people died because of Stalin. And you're saying, you know that God is love because he raises your chicken from the dead? But that's a mentality that people have about, well, I believe in God. I believed in God until something bad happened. So we're dealing with that. <coughs> but... We're also, it, it's, it, at another level, it's a much more serious question. I, I mean, Auschwitz, obviously, because it's just down the road. I went there last year. I have no intention of ever, ever going again. I hated it. Um, for lots and lots and lots of reasons. I mean, I, I, at university, I, I studied Weimar Germany and Nazi Germany. That was my main subject. And 
have always been interested. I watch Schindler's List every year to remind me of why I'm a minister. And Auschwitz, you would think it would be something when the, the, the guided tour, I kind of knew all the stuff. Um, but I wouldn't go back because it's just, for me, it's too overwhelming. I'll take my door. I'll go back if I have to take my door. But other than that, I, I don't particularly want to go back. And I know that there are people who go and say, well, there can't be a God. And there are other people who go the opposite. I want to kind of do the almost impossible thing for some people of saying that actually Auschwitz is a reason for believing in God rather than a reason against. So uh, let's see where we go with this. And there'll probably be lots of holes. That, this satisfies me, so that's fine. Um, uh, you might want to quiz and question and disagree, and please do that. Uh, I, I don't like Christians being incredibly polite all the time and then going away thinking, oh, that was rubbish, or I didn't agree with that, or what did you mean by that? Say it to my face. Um, you slap me, I'll slap you back. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's think about this. We're going to think about it at a philosophical level first. So, you know, okay, it's a wee bit heavy, but you're advanced apologetics people. Like, you're the brainy ones. You can cope. So, let's do this. What is evil? Well, there are four basic opposed camps. The first is, evil is, can, we can think of moral absolutism. That holds that good and evil are fixed concepts established by a deity or deities, uh, nature, morality, common sense, or some other source. Um, you may be aware that up until recently, most vast majority of atheists would deny that evil existed was an absolute. Um, but Sam Harris is desperately trying to show that it is. Uh, I find it quite interesting. I do a lot of debates with atheists and, and get stoked by some of them. And I was doing one in a place once and there were some atheists came along and they blogged on it afterwards and they said, Robo, which is what they call, Red Robo is what they call me. Um, Red Robo was, he was actually okay. He was quite pleasant and, and spoke well and quite humorous and they said, but he's Jekyll and Hyde. We all know that that's pretense, he's really evil. Now I just love the atheist concept of evil. You know, how, how does that work? But most people have some idea of what evil is and um, from the Christian perspective, we're in this first camp, we're at moral absolutism. Amoralism claims that good and evil are meaningless concepts that there is no moral ingredient in nature. Um, please, I mean, you obviously know the difference between immorality and amorality. Uh, amorality says, basically, there is no morality. Moral relativism is still the majority position, which holds that standards of good and evil are only products of local culture, custom, or prejudice. And so they vary. And then there's a new one, and I'm struggling how to explain this because I'm not sure I understand it. But it, it, it's the attempt to find a compromise between moral absolutism and the relativist view. So moral universalism claims that morality is flexible, but only to a degree, and that what is truly good or evil can be determined by examining what is commonly considered to be evil amongst all humans. That gets very close to Sam Harris's position. From a personal point of view, I, I, and from an apologetic point of view, I would just simply say, everyone has a sense of good and evil. Every child goes, that's not fair. We all have an awareness of right and wrong, and it's highly doubtful, very difficult to prove that it's just culturally conditioned. I think also, I think that sense of good and evil is unique to human beings. I grew up in a farm, and, um, we hold different standards to animals than we do to human beings. My father was a pigman, and uh, when a, a sow, a female pig, gives birth, you're very careful when you're working with those animals not to go near the piglets until their eyes open. Because if you touch them, and the sow smells that you've touched them, she will kill them or eat them. Now, a human mother does that, she's going to jail or to psychiatric eunuch. A pig does that, you don't hold the pig morally accountable. Um, it's one of the ma major things about being human. So the argument is that there is good and evil. Um, I want to 
then think about how the atheist thinks of good and evil. We want to argue, we, we would say in Christian theology, that God is omnipotent and that God is perfectly good and that evil exists. The atheist is going to say because evil exists, God cannot be omnipotent or cannot be perfectly good. Or one of the others. It's a standard classic argument. If God was perfectly good, then God would, uh, and all powerful, then God would be able to and would desire to prevent evil because evil exists. Therefore, if there is a God, he cannot be perfectly good. Or perfect. And that's, I don't know how many times I've heard that cited as the absolute knockdown argument. And I don't think it is. Here's uh, kind of Richard Dawkins' way of explaining this. I'll, I'll quote more than I've got up here, <laughs> but just to give you the context. The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. It must be so. If there ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is a bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. I think you should memorize that last sentence. Because when you're talking to an atheist, you're saying, this is the universe. This is what you believe. It's not how you live, and you can't live like that. But that is at bottom. That is your foundation. There is no evil, there is no good. And by the way, that wipes out almost all the atheist arguments immediately about God. Well, how could a God of so-and-so allow this? What about the God of the Old Testament? Isn't he evil? No, there is no evil. What's your problem? It's only the Christian who has the problem with that. The non-Christian should have no problem with it. So think, please. Stop being contradictory. But that, that's, uh, there is a real problem for the atheist. Because the atheist has to believe there is no creation. There's no life after death. There's no ultimate foundation for morality. There's no ultimate meaning in life. And crucially, there is no human free will. You go to court, you're charged with rape, you say, it's my genes. Genetic determinism is kind of hardcore Calvinism without God. Now, Calvinism with God is brilliant, right? <laughs> Calvinism without, without God is like hell. And that's what the the, the new atheists and atheist philosophy teaches. Now I think the prophet for the 20th century, and the implications still exist, is of course a European philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. He understood atheist philosophy extremely well. And he argued that the bulk of humanity has misunderstood concepts such as evil and good. In his key work, Beyond Good and Evil, he says this, We believe that severity, violence, slavery, danger in the street and in the heart, secrecy, stoicism, tempter's art and devilry of every kind, that everything wicked, terrible, tyrannical, predatory and serpentine in man serves as well for the elevation of the human species as its opposite. And what he's saying is this, Beethoven is for the good of humanity. Auschwitz is ultimately for the good of humanity. All things work together for the good of humanity, including evil. Now, Nietzsche is hugely important because that means that you can be in your nice country house in Krakow, you can play Mozart on the piano, you can say your prayers in the morning, and you could head off to Auschwitz and kill 10,000 people in a day and go back home and have your, your wine and your meat and your vegetables and say, that's fine. All that I'm doing is removing rats out of the human infestation. 
And that's a kind of very, very dramatic example, but we can do it in other ways. We can, you can say, for example, you could go off to work and you could be a surgeon and you can operate on a young woman and take the child out of her womb and pull it to pieces and go home and say, I'm serving humanity. Nietzsche understood that. His point was simply that what we call morally evil actually helps human beings evolve higher thinking capacities, quicker reflexes, or greater problem-solving skills. In fact, ultimately, you have to say that there is no such thing as evil. According to atheistic evolution, anything that furthers the human spirit species should be deemed as good. And that, that's the logical and straightforward position, and I know very, very few people who actually hold to it. What's wrong with it? Well, let's turn to our friend C.S. Lewis. As he made his journey from atheism to theism before he be became a Christian, he realized that the problem of evil was a greater problem for the atheist than it is for the Christian. And here's why. He explains it. It's only he can. I'm sorry it's, the words are so crowded there, but you, you'll pick it up in mere Christianity. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? Going back again to what Dawkins says, the universe has, doesn't have these properties. So how did Lewis get it? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have just given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of my reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. My atheist friends get really, really upset when I use the hashtag NFA, stands for New Fundamentalist Atheist, because I say your faith is too simple. They get really upset by that as well, saying they've got a faith. I don't have a faith, I think. Okay, start thinking. Because if you're going to say, I don't believe in God because of evil, but then you're going to say that evil doesn't exist, isn't your first statement ludicrous? Isn't the whole basis of the new atheism, where you get the anger from, there is no God and I hate him? How does that make sense? But that's the way in which it works. And, and Lewis, as always, just expresses it totally brilliant. Uh, William Lane Craig, not quite so eloquent, but he does it in, in this way. <coughs> My argument would go like this. If God does not exist, then objective moral, va mor moral values do not exist. <coughs> Evil exists. Therefore... Objective moral values exist. That is to say, some, some things are really evil, therefore God exists. Uh, logically, that makes perfect sense. Uh, it's not the kind of argument that you sit down with when someone says, why did my uh, baby son just die? Well, let me just explain this to you. One, two, three, four. You don't do that. That's, we're human beings. Okay, we don't operate like computers. But that is very, very important. Richard Dawkins says that it's very hard to conceive of objective moral values out with religion. But evil does exist. Objective moral values therefore exist. Some things really are evil, therefore God exists. Um, my wife works as a mental health officer. Uh, her job is to section people who are profoundly ill and a danger to themselves or to society to compel them to be confined to, for treatment. Uh, she works a lot with psychiatrists, and I remember one time we were having this conversation, maybe 30, 40 years ago, a lot of psychiatrists would have denied evil. We find that less and less the case now, at least in, in our context. She told me once that uh, she came home and she was talking about a patient with a psychiatrist, and she said, you know, do you think there's some kind of neurosis or psychosis? And the psychiatrist said, no, it's just evil. That's an interesting concept. Freud would have been very disappointed. Um, <laughs> What the atheist does, though, it's very interesting. The atheist will accept the concept of evil, 
but they change the meaning of the word. And it's important to grasp this. They change the meaning of the word to suffering. And that's a very important change. There's a guy called J.L. Mackey who has a book called The Miracle of Theism. And he says, there's an atheist, if a theist could show that suffering in the world had some legitimate use, then the concept of the God of the Bible is at least logically and formally possible. Dan Barker says that the problem of evil is really the problem of unabsorbed evil. The kind of world where suffering happens and we don't know why or what has occurred. So for the atheist, and actually for most people, the idea of evil is the problem of unnecessary suffering. Because there's necessary suffering. Um, I don't like needles. Uh, when I was ill, uh, every now and then people would come and stick needles in me to get blood out of me. In fact, it was quite funny because they, they, they stuck so many and they were having difficulty getting blood. My arm was like a junkie's and uh, the dead legs and all this. And they had one nurse who was quite funny. They called her Dracula because she could get blood out of anything. And uh, so uh, the, the doctors would just say, we give up. You know, we're sending Dracula for you. You know, and she stuck the needle in. Now, sticking a needle in someone is painful. I don't like it, but it's for a good reason. So there, there can be reasons for suffering and pain. But what, what about unnecessary suffering? The problem here is that that then places the atheist or the human being saying this suffering is pointless. It's their definition of pointless. They're putting themselves in the position of being able to judge it. And here, to my mind, the best modern apologist in terms of <coughs> answering this question is Tim Keller. This is what he says. Tucked away within the assertion that the world is filled with pointless evil is a hidden premise. Namely, that if evil appears pointless to me, then it must be pointless. And incidentally, in, in, in all of apologetics, that's a key question you've got to keep going back to because people are making observations which are taken as given, but you've got to actually say, well, wait a minute, why? You have got to be the annoying kid who when they go to their dad or mom and say, Dad, why does this happen? And you go, well, because of this. Yeah, but why that? Well, because of that. Well, why that? Because of that. And they keep going, why, why, why? It's all the way back ad infinitum. You have got to be that person saying, why? Why are you saying this is pointless? How do you know that this is pointless? The reasoning is, of course, facetious because or fallacious rather, just because you can't see or imagine a good reason why God might allow something to happen doesn't mean that there can't be one. Again, we see lurking, says Keller, within supposedly hard-nosed skepticism an enormous faith in one's own cognitive faculties. If our minds can't plumb the depths of the universe for good answers to suffering, well then there can't be any. This is blind faith of the highest order. I would always say that to the atheist when I say you've got faith, and they say, well, what do I have faith in? I say, first of all, you have faith that you have the ability to discern any evidence for God. That you have the ability to determine. That you have the ability to work out. That's an enormous faith. Usually they have faith in the ultimate goodness or progression of humanity as well, which is also an extraordinary faith. Ironically, it is the atheist who lives by the blind faith that he mistakenly attributes to the theist. When I wasn't a Christian, I don't really have that much problem with, with, with evil. It's a case of suck it up and see. In uh, the United Kingdom, but also in other places in Europe and in the United States, the, uh, the New Atheist did a, a bus campaign with slogans on buses. There is probably no God, which I always love the fact that they put probably. There is probably no God, so cheer up and enjoy yourself. And I remember debating the person who initiated that campaign and saying to her, do you know, only a very comfortable, liberal, middle-class, West London person could have done that. She said, why? I said, come on, think about it. Imagine you're a woman who you've just buried your son who's committed suicide. And you look up and you see on a bus, there's probably no God. Oh, that's good. I can cheer up now and enjoy myself. It doesn't deal with any of the problems. It doesn't deal with any of the questions. So, 
where do we go from here? I, I, I'm, what, I, what I hope I've shown a little bit there is actually evil is a bigger problem for the atheist. But for the Christian, how do we deal with it in terms of the problem? And in particular, um, if the world's created good, why is there the devil? I think it's really important you believe in the devil. Uh, I think it's quite difficult to go to Auschwitz and not believe in the devil. I think evil is a very, very real thing and a far more powerful thing than we are prepared to admit. Did God create a perfect world and then get it wrong? Or did God create a perfect world which he allowed to go wrong? Now, I, I wrestled with this for a long, long time. And there is a person whom I absolutely love. I have never, ever come across anyone better for answering this question. And that is uh, St. Augustine. Um, I, kinda, I mean, I like reading a lot of modern stuff, but you can get a huge amount of uh, uh, the old church fathers as well. And um, Augustine, of course, is absolutely fantastic on this. And here's his, I'm, I'm simplifying his answer. First of all, God created all things. We accept that, totally. You, we, we, we do not split and say there's a good world and a bad world, good God and a bad God. The devil creates nothing. Pleasures come from God. God creates all things. So what about evil? This is Augustine's answer. Evil is not created. It's not a created thing. He argues that evil is simply the absence of good. He then goes on to say, evil is permitted. God did not create evil, but he permits it for the good. Now, I'll give you a couple of quotes from him. He says this, And in the universe, even that which is called evil, when it is regulated and put in its own place, only enhances our admiration of the good, for we enjoy and value the good more when we compare it with the evil. For the Almighty God, who has even the heathen acknowledged, has supreme power over all things, being himself supremely good, would never permit the existence of anything evil among his works if he were not so omnipotent and good that he can bring good even out of evil. Now that for me is another sentence I would remember. Why? Because when someone comes with a classic argument and says, well, if God is good and God is omnipotent, then he can't permit evil. Instead of having a lower view of God, you've got to have a higher view of God, which says, actually, my God is so omnipotent that he can bring good out of evil. That's the difference. Now, that works in practically lots and lots of different ways. We'll maybe discuss some examples later on, but I can think of one, um, a couple in New Zealand who are farmers whose two boys were killed in a barn fire. And somebody very cruelly said to them, where's your God now then? And the woman said, if God does not exist, life is hell. This makes no sense. She said, I believe in God more than ever. And you will find often that people who've gone through immense suffering, it drives them towards God rather than away. Augustine's, um, the second one there, <coughs> he judged it better to bring good out of evil than not to permit any evil to exist. I think that uh, that's where we're going with all of this. Sometimes I've done it at a very populist level. The way I would explain it is this. I would say, if I were God and I could create you so that you did not feel any pain, you did not have any broken relationships, there was no possibility of you getting cancer, there was no angst, there was no worry, no sorrow, no tears, would you want that? Yeah, absolutely, I would want that. Okay, I'm going to make you a chair. Because that chair that you're sitting on is not thinking there right now going, oh, I really wish that she hadn't sat down on me. I wish it was somebody lighter. Or uh, I, I really wish that I wasn't a chair. If only I could be a table. Or I'm not thinking, I wonder why the chair at the back doesn't like me. Or what is the meaning of life as a chair? You know, there's no, uh, the chair has no concept, no feeling, no, you know, that's fine. And if you want to follow the, the Buddhist concept, Buddhist heaven is nirvana 
which is nothing. You don't feel anything. Good, sorrow, peace, joy. No, 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 it's all gone. It's the complete absence of feeling. Is it possible to have a world in which human beings can have a choice or human beings can freely love if the only option that they can do is love? And if the only option that they can do is love, how is that love? What if God created a world in which human beings, in order for human beings to freely love, there had to, they, there had to be pain and sorrow and suffering. There had to be choice as well. I, I'm, I'm going to say be really careful with the free will argument, by the way, because if you use it in its absolutist sense, then um, an intelligent non-Christian will be able to pick up and say, well, do we really, really, really have absolute free will? And then you refer them to Martin Luther's bondage of the will and hope they never come back. But um, it's, you, 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 it's more than just the notion of free will. It's how does God create human beings who will freely love him? Can he create human beings who are compelled to love him? And in what sense then is that free? So it's a, it's a completely uh, different way of looking at it. I think that uh, maybe another way of putting it is this. I once saw a play in which there were two boys and they're walking along a... Um, well, it was a stage actually, but they're meant to be walking along and one of them's got a pet bird. And he said, see, my pet pigeon loves me. And the other guy says, yeah, yeah, right. He says, watch. And he throws it up in the air and it flies up to the top of a tree. And he says, watch. Come here, come here. And he's, it's only got on a piece of string and he pulls it back and he says, see, it loves me. Come back to me when I told it to. And the other guy says, don't be stupid. You've got it on a string. Cut the string. Cut the string and see what happens. And the play then morphed into a song entitled Cutting Our Own Strings. Can we freely love God if he's got us on a string so that the only thing that we can do is come to him? How is that free love? So I think that um, if you're going to look at it at that kind of philosophical level, part of the price of being human is that we have to have freedom and that there, there, we, we have to be able to get emotions and things that are wrong. I am, sorry, I left this in the air. I have uh, uh, three children. I have a teenage daughter. There is a way that I can guarantee that my teenage daughter will never drink, never take drugs, and never have sex until she leaves home. It's dead simple. I can just lock her in her room. I can make sure she never leaves the house. I know she's not going to get knocked over by a bus because I'll never let her out in the street. There are parents who are control freaks like that. What does that do to her? That dehumanizes her. You know, I used to think, uh, I, well I now think that my mother mustn't have really loved me. Because when I was 11 years old, she would let me go play on top of 200 foot cliffs. You know, climb down ropes, cycle bikes down really steep hills. I keep thinking, she must have been trying to get rid of me, really. You know, she let me hitchhike around Europe with a tent when I was 16. You know, I'd never do that now. What an irresponsible parent. I'm going, no, what a great mom. Maybe God, as a great father, made us in his image, with the knowledge in righteousness and holiness. And the price of that is we experience evil. He judged it better to bring good out of evil than not to permit any evil to exist. So here's the, the kind of argument. God specifically created human beings to be immortal, free moral agents, responsible for their, own, for their actions, with this life being their one and only probationary period in which our eternal fate is determined by our response to God's will during earthly life. So the world is good because it's as good as any world could be for fulfilling God's purpose. It's designed to function, as one man argues, as God's veil of soul making. The physical environments in which human beings were to reside was specifically created with all the characteristics for achieving that purpose. This environment has to be arranged so that it allows humans to be free moral agents, provides us with basic physical needs, allows us to be challenged, 
and enable us to learn the things we most need to learn. <coughs> My argument would be that that's how God created the world, that humanity fell. From then on, evil is part of human life. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once argued that uh, the one Christian doctrine that was totally provable was the doctrine of original sin. It's dead easy to prove. So, come back to the definition of evil. For the atheist, evil is suffering or physical pain. 1 John 3 verse 4, for the Christian, evil is the breaking of God's law. Sin is the only evil. Pain is not necessarily evil, and suffering can have good consequences. Suffering, pain, and hardship encourage people to cultivate their spirits and to grow in moral character, acquiring virtuous attributes such as courage, patience, humility, and fortitude. Suffering can stimulate us towards spiritual growth. I don't know a Christian who's matured who hasn't suffered. I know a lot of immature Christians. And one of the reasons is that they haven't suffered. It stimulates people to develop compassion, sympathy, love, and empathy. Now, in all of this, we have to say who's in the best position to know whether something is good or evil? Who's the best position to know how things are going to work out? Well, that's got to be, of course, it has to be God. God, an atheist will come and say, well, this is wrong, we can turn and say, but what you don't know is. And actually, as Christians, we have to be incredibly humble because we don't know the answers. I could make a lot of speculation about the ge genocide and the Holocaust and why God allowed it to happen. And I've got my own thoughts on that, but they're just that, they're my own thoughts. I think God knows, and that's what you have to trust. And that's where it comes in with Job. Um, about 12 years ago, I preached through the book of Job, and I didn't know what to do. I went to speak to an Old Testament professor, and he said, you can do it two ways, Dave. You can do it thematically, or you can do it chapter by chapter. And he says, chapter by chapter is a problem, because there's quite a lot of misery in there. And I was immediately convinced I like Leonard Cohen, I'm a Scottish football fan, I live in the beautiful Scottish weather, so for me, misery, that my home environment, I'm happy. So I went, I'm going to go through the whole thing. And I went through the book of Job and I thought, what I'll do is, I'll do 10 weeks, chapter at a time, and if it's not working, forget it, I'm going to do something else. And I, I went through all 40 chapters, um, two years ago I did it again. And I have to say that in my view, it's the most effective evangelistic series I've ever done, and I didn't intend it to be. Because non-Christians loved it. They absolutely loved it. One man came, I'd, I'd buried his uh, mother, and he came to church with all his extended family, big working class family, most of them never been in church. At that point we had pews, we were quite a small congregation, they filled up three pews, and I came in and I went, oh my goodness, I don't believe this. This family are here, and it was like the sermon was on death, death, and mega death. You know, it was just, and I just thought, they are going to hate this. You know, and I, I adapted it a wee bit and so on, but still. Anyway, came out and he said, to, he looked at me and he said, you did that deliberately, didn't you? And I said, what do you mean? I've never listened to anyone speak for more than five minutes in my life. He said, you gave us a year's worth of sermons in one go. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I normally speak for 40 minutes. So that's amazing. I said, what do you think of it? He said, I thought it was... Great, he said, I didn't know that all that was in the Bible. I said, that's just one chapter, I've got thousands more. I said, uh, will you be back? He said, no. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have a happy ending in that sense. But I still maintain contact with him. But what fascinated me about him was he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And you know the great thing about Job, and I'm sum up Job in this. Job is where this guy suffers so much, he loses all this kind, he loses so many things, and he his friends are useless trying to comfort him and he argues with them and he questions God and he says, why? Why is all this happening? What's going on? This is not fair. And God answers him by saying, look at the hippopotamus. And you think, how does that work? Because the why question is actually not the big question. If you accept that God is omniscient and good, then in faith you're going to say, God knows. So who knows? God knows, not me. 
And you've got to believe that God is good. The easiest thing for the non-Christian to believe is to believe that God is good. Sometimes the hardest thing for the Christian to believe is to believe that God is good. Because the devil's coming to say, how can that be? How can that be? How can that be? Always gets us to question the goodness and love of God. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? What a great line. Would you condemn me that you may be justified? God is in the best position to know. I think that um, we end up in terms of God's interrogation of Job saying this, humanity's knowledge is limited, especially when it comes to suffering. The only one whose mind knows more about the consequences of all actions, whose mind is in a better position to know what will happen if this action is permitted, whose mind has the ability to see the bigger picture is God. Uh, my wife had an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, there was a, a well-formed child in her womb who died. And we met, um, at the time, one of the ways we coped with it, we said, well, well God knows. God knows what, have, what would have happened to that child if that child had lived. God, we, we trust God in that respect. And we met with a genetic counselor. And he said, I'm not a Christian. He says, but you're going to love this. He said, the way that the human body is designed, he said, is you would think it really was designed. And he said, in your case, he said, the design, if you like, had gone wrong. And it was better that your child didn't live. And they were kind of hard words to say, but actually he told us what we knew already because we believed that because of God. Who alone is in the position to know how much suffering is permissible to bring about the ultimate good for humankind? Only the infinite, eternal, omniscient creator, the God of the Bible. How does that work in practice? Well, pastorally it works in lots of different ways. Um, I, maybe you can ask about things, but I can think of so, so many different examples. Um, I met with a woman about four weeks ago, I was speaking in a housing scheme, and she came up to me and she had very, very sad eyes, and she told me her story. Her husband had died of a brain hemorrhage. She's left with four young kids. She lives in a scheme. She discovers she's got a brain tumor. She doesn't want to go in a hospital because of her kids. She has people come and visit her every night because sometimes she collapses in a coma. Um, it's really just absolutely horrendous. She's terrified. And I looked at her and I just said to her, you know, life's junk, isn't it? Life's horrendous. And she said, yeah, it is. I said, it's ugly. She said, yes, it absolutely is ugly. Life is ugly. And I said, what if it could be beautiful? What if there was beauty in the midst of all the ugliness? And she just started crying. And she said, I don't know. Is that possible? And I, I only have one place to point her, and that's to Jesus. I, I say, well, look, Jesus is beautiful, and I want to tell you about him. And she, I told her, and she said, if only that were true. If only that were true. We don't want to be Job's comforters or to be comforted by Job's friends, but to believe that God is good and the giver of all things good. And that in the midst of the pain and the sorrow and the suffering and the hell, that there is beauty. It's just fantastic. I think um, Dostoevsky, I love Dostoevsky. Um, in the Brothers Karamazov, he keeps a record of all the bad things happening in the world. And uh, I mean, honestly, I, I don't understand how every single Russian speaker is not a Christian because you should read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and so on. And I want to talk to Mr. Putin and tell him what real Russian heritage is, you know. Um, I, but, you know, you read Dostoevsky, you think, how did you get this? How did you grasp this? And I think that he understood the problem of evil and all the bad things. The question then is, how do you cope without Christ? Because what's God's way of dealing with evil? And the answer to that is the cross, which in one sense is both the ugliest and the most beautiful thing in the world. 
For the believer, I would say this, and I'm quoting Dostoevsky from Crime and Punishment. Pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. The really great men must, I think, have great sadness on earth. You want to serve Jesus, you want to communicate the gospel, you are setting yourself up for a life of suffering and pain because you're going to be ministering to people who go through great suffering and pain and you have to be with them. And you can't just do a course and go, hey brother, I feel your pain, because that's rubbish. They know, people know, they're not stupid, they know. I think the Christian hope for me is summed up by Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, where um, Samwise comes out of his kind of coma or whatever. Gandalf, you're alive, you're alive. Is it true? You know, he says it's true. And then he, he wonders, he said, will all things bad come untrue? And I think that's my hope. I, I really do. I think that's my hope. I think that there's tremendous evil and pain and suffering in this world. I believe that God is absolutely good and absolutely pure, that he can do no evil and no wrong. I believe he demonstrated that through Jesus Christ. And I believe that that's what we have to offer anyone who's suffering. And that's why, by the way, I think the health and prosperity gospel or any form of it is so blasphemous and is so twisted and itself sick and evil because it's taking away the beauty of what God has done in Christ. And you're saying to the poor and the suffering, it's there, it's there, Jesus is there for you. And it just makes such an enormous difference. That's why this is so important for me. Um, you know, the cross is, is where it's all at. Uh, I, I put a list there of some books, and we'll, we'll, take, we'll discuss things just now, but John Wenham's The Enigma of Evil has, al has always been really, really helpful to me. Uh, C.S. Lewis, Problem of Pain, Grief Observed, Mere Christianity, Tim Keller's Reason for God, his latest book on suffering as well. Dostoevsky, I didn't put any titles because anything by Dostoevsky, but um, Crime and Punishment, The Brothers Karamazov, which by the way, Freud said was the greatest uh, of all. Um, incidentally, uh, if, you, if you email me, I'll send you this, this PowerPoint if you want so you can have. Uh, Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil, if you really, really want to get depressed, but please do not sit and read it late at night on a drink. Scottish winter's night with a bottle of whiskey, listening to Leonard Cohen with a knife beside your side, because you, you, you will not make it through. But um, uh, useful to know. And then Augustine on the Trinity, Confessions, City of God, and especially one that's not so well known, Incridion, which deals uh, in, in several sections of this whole question of uh, evil.